Well, hi there. I'm. Can, can we start again? Oh, we're live. Oh, we are? <laughs> <laughs> okay, hi there. I'm Susie uh, Celine, and this is another story with uh, Ken Walter, and this is Susie's Las Vegas. We are, when we left last, uh, last week, uh, leaving Burundi, Ken was talking about his, his life in the Secret Service and the Foreign Service and all that, so he's got a lot of stuff to talk about today. Uh, I do have to apologize. I'm a little under the gun. Um, I've had a um, problem in my family. Uh, Dave Celine had brain surgery. And for the past week, it's been an ongoing nightmare, I guess. But he's hopefully he's going to start feeling better because he had major surgery yesterday. So anyways, please keep him in your prayers. Let's get back to the show again. I'm Susie, and here is Ken Walder. Hi. Susie's a real trooper to still want to do the show today with all that's going on in her life. So she's to be commended for that. Okay. Thanks, Ken. I appreciate it. Okay. So... Uh, as you recall, last time I was winding up a three-year assignment down to Africa where I went through a long process of fully integrated State Department cover. So when you leave a, a situation where you're under these type of covers, you have to go back and unwind that cover right. and go on to something else. So I uh, had to do that. So uh, the things in Burundi, I'm going to call that the end of an unwritten era of things both unwritten and some that may never be written because people ask, well, what the heck did you do down there besides go hunting and climbing volcanoes and mountains and stuff? Yeah. So we'll get to that, but I have to get approvals to talk more in depth about that, so we'll get to that. Okay. So when you're at an embassy and you're leaving to go on another assignment, you have to put in a, uh, a formal request for reassignment or resignation. So I... In the embassy, you have your station and you have your embassy. And I had to send a cable out, a message, and I gave that to the ambassador's people saying that I was going to go resign. Now, this is a different ambassador than we had there doing the genocides. And okay. He was a good guy. This guy was a, a career foreign service officer, which means he worked his way up through the ranks. He wasn't appointed. He doesn't, didn't buy his ambassadorship like many of the people you've heard of do. Oh, yeah. So he... Uh, he was a good guy. He came in knocking on my office door and he said, Ken, you can't resign. We need people like you. You're a good guy. And I said, well, thank you, Mr. Ambassador, but I'm really not resigning. I said, I'm just going, finishing this post. I'm going to go do something else. And he said, oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. He had yeah. kids, uh, young adults about the same age as me that traveled back and forth to Africa and stuff, too. He wasn't in the uh, Foreign Service. So the ambassador signed off on my orders to go back and I had to go back to um, the CIA's um, Directorate of Science and Technology which we built all these strange equipment that we use overseas and stuff and they had um, an office we never worked in the main headquarters building we spent time there in consults and stuff but we were at a, uh, a facility that was spitting distance of the real State Department it was wow. up on a hill and um, that's where we did all of the experimentation and development of um, everything electronic, video, forgeries, documents, disguise, um, all of these things. And so that's where they assigned me to go back and get training. And I said, that would be good, very good. So went through a very rigorous training in preparation for a, an assignment I was going to take down in Panama, which would be covering North, uh, Central and South America working primarily against narcotics at that time because that was the big deal. So um, going, resigning from the State Department and going back to a normal citizen, so to speak, was a real mess because the State Department is really um, an inefficient place. So I had to spend a couple of days just going through from one little window and office to the other to hand in my passports and get a signature. 
because people weren't there. They were out to lunch. There were this and that. And it was just uh, it was, it was a real a mess. So I'm glad I really resigned from the State Department. <laughs> now sounds like it. Yeah. Wow. So when you work for the agency as a staffer, that's what they call people, staffers. You get a little blue badge on a on a lanyard, and it's uh, just a little blue plastic laminated badge, and some has letters on it, and some doesn't. The letters on it, like H and C and these different things, G, would designate which areas you were allowed to go into, because we had some areas that even as a staffer, everything was compartmented and you couldn't go to different areas. Wow. So with this little blue badge, you could go into a lot of places, including the State Department. You could have free run of the State Department, pretty much. And here's the thing, the agency's so worried about cover, right? So they have this little thing called a blue bus. If we have a picture of one of these bluebirds, rather, there that's, it is. That's uh, uh, really looks like the ones we used to have to go in, except they had darkened windows. But it's a little bluebird, a little ratty bus that would go from CIA headquarters into Roslyn, Virginia, and into D.C. and make a milk run up Wisconsin Avenue and so on, dropping people off at the CIA outstations. So I thought, that's really secure. Yeah, I'll bet. <laughs> oh, could, my God. <laughs> someone could wait and take pictures and figure yeah, out or who we're... Uh, goodbye. Uh, or, uh, well, <laughs> yeah. I'll talk wow. about a story about our doctor got killed on the parkway. Oh, really? Going, turning into the CIA building some several years back. He was a doctor oh that God. was doing house calls, if you will, when I was down in Africa. Yeah. So he got his star on the wall. So at any rate, the little bluebird buses wow. that were uh, the way of, of trans going to transfer. So when I was working at this little installation above the State Department and on a little hill, I won't go into too much of uh, what all was there. It's, I believe it's closed now. Is it? Yeah, it went yeah. back to the Navy. But it was it was a pretty neat place to work. It was when, a very what year was that, Ken? This was uh, well the the place up on that hill was there from the. 80s, but this was in oh 70s. This was in 75. Okay. So. So you think it's closed now? Probably. Yeah. It was too nice to keep. Yeah. But <laughs> we had a little snack bar in there as all. So a lot of us would go over to the State Department where they had a real cafeteria. Yeah. And, and we would we would go over there. But here's the thing about the honesty at the state at uh, our CIA annex. We had a, what we called a blind man stand. It was a little place that sold sandwiches and ice cream and goodies and stuff. And it was run by a blind man. And he, um, he could tell you were in there and you'd just tell him what you wanted and you put the money on the counter and leave. But there was nothing to stop anyone from stealing, but that didn't happen. There was just no, there was too much integrity. To, and, sure, and, they and wanted to help him. Yeah. Didn't want to cheat the blind man. Yeah. So just that's the story. If anyone's watching from the old agency days, yeah. they might remember the blind man stand. Yeah. So um, I got uh, resigned and started doing uh, training, and they assigned me to. Again, I was coming from the Office of Communications and going into one of the most elite branches of the uh, agency in the Science and Technology Group. And so I went in there and all of the old timers looked at me. Here I am coming out of Africa. They didn't know who the heck I was. I had kind of longish hair. And they were a little bit dubious because I only had an associate's degree in electronic from Cleveland Institute. And really? All these guys were, had their masters and PhDs. How and long was your hair? Oh, it was like in a picture. It was just uh, down about there. Yeah. Just shaggy. Just, <laughs> just shaggy looking. So, um, the, but. Is that you right there? Yeah, that's my passport yeah. picture where I was cleaned up a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, at any rate, these uh, old timers, and they yeah. were all highly skilled guys, and they were operators and um, good engineers. Yeah. So they said, okay, you're going to go through a lot of rigorous training to get up to speed on what we do, which primarily was bugging people around the world. Wow. And so um, one of the guys I worked with, I'll just have to throw this in. Okay. He designed and built the air bearings for the Sidewinder missile. Wow. And he was just a good old boy. He was just uh, one of the most pleasant guys you ever meet. He didn't think he could uh, do anything, but he was a brilliant guy. So he was one of my mentors. And there were other people in there that were just... Once you got to know them, they were they were super people. So I learned from a lot of good people. Wow. So 
What did we learn in there? So well, first let's go back to what, what is this, seek, this uh, technical services division. Um, it was called TSD and later it was a division and then it grew so popular that it became its own office, Office of Technical Services. And um, they made all the spy gear. This is, uh, I showed you last time, yeah. this the spy Yeah, you craft. had us all curious about that. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll don't have time this time, but we'll yeah. go into all of this stuff in okay. here. And also, the same people and some other people wrote this book called... Uh, CIA Manual. A Manual tri of tri Trickery and Deception. Wow. Well, and this was written by a, a guy who was a... a, a a sleight of hand magician as well as a technician. Yeah. And well, maybe then you some... were trained right, weren't you? <laughs> right. <laughs> There's a guy here in town we might have on too that is a, one of the best sleight of hand guys I've ever okay. seen. Okay, no, that would amazing. be fun. Yeah. I'd like that. Yeah. So um, we we in uh, OTS and, and, and my group, we're the electronicers. We did anything that had to do with electronics, whether it was video, audio, Beacons. Beacons means you put something and track it and locate it and all that. So, um, so how also that included teltap operations. Get it? Well, well, to bug. How do you bug people without getting caught? I mean, I really want to know. About well, that was, that. that was part of the training. How yeah. we kept from getting. Are caught. you allowed to tell us or not? Yeah, I can. I can talk about that. I can yeah. also mention how some people did get caught. Unfortunately, I think I mentioned briefly that one of my friends was caught and put in a Cuban jail for seven years. Yeah. He was caught, had machine guns at his neck and oh my he was God. making an entry. So people do get caught, but yeah. most of us don't. Most of us is well planned and uh, executed. So hmm. um, learning how to do tell taps around the world, every place is different. You just don't go like you see in a movie, some, some Dingbat puts a little thing on a phone wire and, and it, it's tapped. It's a lot you know, more than that. Because no, it can't be discovered, so you can't have any evidence that anything's on that line. Okay. And we had uh, ways of tapping into lines, and we even had to do... Sometimes we would put a transmitter on that phone line, and it would transmit the phone signal to wherever you could have a, what we call a listening post. Okay. A lot of those listening posts might be mobile. They might be in a car. They might be in a van. But that way you could get the signal away from the main place where you were operating. Yeah. So um, that's that's the group I went into, what we call the audio operations branch. It was all, always the, the coolest branch, the, all the other ones in there. That they called us a little bit of um, knuckle draggers sometimes. And well, that must have been really interesting. Yeah. Do you know what a knuckle dragger no, is? No, I was going to ask you that. What <laughs> is a knuckle dragger? <laughs> that's a, kind of a pejorative that they use for people who, even in the military, your knuckle dragger, your guy is like an ape. You just drag your knuckles around the ground. You're just, oh yeah, uh, yeah. you're not very bright, but you're doing a job. <laughs> so they called us knuckle draggers and because um, we got down and did some of the dirty stuff that needed to be done. Wow. So that was uh, that. And later on, I was trained in, uh, in what they call the incident response team which helped in hostage rescue things. That was later on in my career, which was even more exciting. Wow. And um, So did you rescue hostages? Uh, I assisted. Did you? Yeah, in, in some pretty good Was that, uh, where was that? Well, I won't tell you where, but I had to work sometimes with the uh, Delta Force and okay. uh, SEALs. All right. They were the guys that took down the, the bad guys. And they were very good at it. They're highly skilled at that sort of thing. Yeah. Like blowing a door down or yeah. making an entry with uh, debt cord or whatever. But we gave them the information that told them where to do it, how many were in there, what they were armed with, and stuff like that. Wow. Because we had to collect that intelligence for however we could. And a lot of times that was sneaking stuff in on the plane or the school or the bus or wherever the hostage was held. Mm -hmm. Later on, I'll get into some of the things I put bugs in. You okay. won't believe it. To, to get that I'm curious sleep. about. I bet our audience is too. <laughs> yeah. You know, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. I mean, this is really interesting. So, it was interesting training. How, how do you get not get caught? Well, when you have a, an adversary or a target that's on the other side of a wall, mm -hmm. 
we developed what they called was a silent drill, but it really wasn't silence. It's it was a silenced, a little bit less noisy, but it was a big. It was a three quarter inch core bit that had to go through concrete walls, and then you had to stop, you had to know how thick the wall was and take out this big core and then you had to go with a little pinhole drill which was uh, like a grit drill and it would mm -hmm. spit stuff in there and make the debris come out so you could make a, a little tenth of an inch hole wow. that you could put your microphone up against and beautiful audio. Wow. But you had to be very careful because the people on the other side may not appreciate you bugging them. So, no, And no. you didn't want to get caught. So we had to use all kinds of drills. We used uh, big drills, little drills. I even worked on a couple of drills that were so big they were to go under long distances under the ground. And these are uh, like oil rig drills to go, like if you're going from one building to another and you yeah. had to pass types in there. So drilling was part of what we did. That's why they called us knuckle draggers, I guess, because we had to <laughs> drill stuff. But uh, wow, we also had to learn other things that I think were just fantastic things for me, there was woodworking. We yeah. had to do, learn how to work with wood. We had to work with plastering. And the 84-year-old uh, gentleman named Charlie was uh, the, our trainer for many, many techs, went through Charlie's course, and he worked you to death. He would have you build your own wall, first uh, concrete and then the, 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 we were primarily working overseas, and they don't have drywall. They have solid walls. So you'd have to build um, use cinder blocks, then you'd have brown coat, and then you'd have plastering, beautiful plastering. We made our own plaster with um, um, in big vats that or wheelbarrows, actually. Yeah. It was beautiful white plaster. And then we'd plaster this beautiful stuff and then we'd have to destroy it and drill it, and we'd have to restore it. And all this took days, working pretty much 14 hours a day or so. Yeah. And then when you, he, it approved, then he'd say, knock it down. So we'd tear it down and have to put all the pieces in the dumpster. But this was done just outside of the main DC area in a training facility we had. So a lot of people went through the drilling and restoration. This guy, Charlie, he was the master plasterer they did all the fresco paintings and restoration in the White House and in other governments. Really? He was, wow. He was a perfectionist and he was a taskmaster. So that I, so, I so you have that. another another trait. That's if right, all else fails, <laughs> you can be a plaster and you can work in homes and stuff like that. Yeah. Wow. We also made concealment devices of all kinds of things. We had to put stuff in concealments that could be either opened or permanent. So we had to learn that aspect of it. We had, I learned how to make molds of resin and, and antique them so it looked like something else so we could swap something out with a bug in it. Wow. So that was fun. I learned a lot of fun things. Uh, and then one of the things that was very arduous was the surreptitious entries. We had to learn how to defeat locks and get into a place. And some of the locks nowadays are, are electronic and that's a whole different world. I'm not gonna go into that. But wow. uh, the old fashioned locks, the European locks were fantastic. You practically yeah. couldn't pick them. So we had to learn how to do that. And rather than pick a lock, because if you pick a lock open, you also have to pick it closed. And if you do that, that takes a lot of time on target, we call it. At the front door, you're Oh, yeah, caught you're, you're around. out there, you know. Yeah. yeah. So we learned how to do what we called key impressioning. You'd have to do a survey first and look at the lock and you'd see what the cylinder looked like. And you could make a little mold of that cylinder and then you'd go get a, a blank that would fit that cylinder. Yeah. And then you'd insert a blank key in there, pull it out and wearing some goggles. You would use a, a very beautiful Swiss file and you'd file that down and put it in. And the pins that keep the lock from opening would make indentations on the key blank. So you'd have to file that down, try it, file that down, and you'd make a key right at the door. You could, then you could go in and out anytime you wanted. So that's called key impressioning, and you'd make that right on site. And to me, that's Did more- Did you ever get caught? That's what no. I wanna know. 
No, I. Oh my goodness. I never got caught. Some some of the keys, some of the older locks were easy to pick, and you yeah. could tell from experience which yeah. ones, uh, what they call wafer disc locks. Those are not. Well, were they were they in places, Ken, where you had to worry about other people seeing you uh, doing all this? Well, that's part of the survey. Yeah. You have to take all that in. What who can see us? How long are you going to have on target? And what are you going to do when you get in and all that? Yeah. So that's part of the. the Again, the, the CIA is under the executive branch, and to get any time to approve an op, it has to go through various stages of approval, including maybe up to the presidential level, depending on how serious it is. So we have to submit these very detailed reports, operational proposals, to make sure that everything looks good to the to the people that are sure. reviewing these things. Yeah. So that's what. Um, the training, I think I mentioned briefly in one other talk, it may not have been here, it may have been somewhere else, about how we went to get into a denied residence in Burma. Yeah. And the plan showed that we could just go in because the gardener was going to leave the back door open to go in. But when we got on site, the door was not open for us. So fortunately, I had my pick set with me and to get in the back door. But that, that they would have wow. never approved doing that. But no. we had to do it, and it was successful. Well, that's good. But yes, I'll just briefly mention, since we have a little bit of time. Yeah. One of my friends was working <laughs> in India, and he was up above, uh, it was in a beautiful residence, and he was in a crawl space above the main dining area. Yeah. And he accidentally put his foot through the ceiling. <laughs> Oh my God. And uh, that was pretty bad. Uh, what did you do then? Well, I, I didn't, but <laughs> the chief of station had to uh, go admit to the government that, yes, we were, we were uh, in there yeah. and had a little accident. And uh, yeah. mostly, if you have good relations with the country, you can buy your way out. And at that time, there was a, such a big surplus of rupees that they, I think they put a lot of money to, to get this hushed up. And then, of course, some of our techs had to go restore the ceiling. Wow. And it blew the operation as far as... Uh, oh, yeah, uh, I would think so. That would be a major, <laughs> yeah, major it's, deal, it's, wouldn't it's it? It's pretty hard to do. Yeah. So some of the training we did, and also included making dead drops. What's a dead drop? A I'm dead sure our drop. audience wants to... What yeah. is a dead drop? That's when you... Um, that's the way you communicate with an agent. A lot of times you'll have something, a stick of wood or or a thing that uh, maybe could be an old milk carton or anything that looks like trash, yeah. including a dead rat, that had been modified to hold maybe film or instructions or something like that. So we had to learn how to make dead drops. And the object was you would have a plan arranged where you drop it so many feet into a park by a trash bin or a tree and your agent would go in, or you'd put a signal up somewhere to let him know that the dead drop site was loaded. Yeah. And then when it's loaded, then the agent would go in at some other point and look for the dead drop, pick it up, and yeah. put it in a bag or something, and then leave the area, and then he'd go get his instruction. It could be, maybe he was getting a crypto pad, maybe he was getting film, maybe he was getting money, maybe he was getting anything. Wow. So dead drops. And I'll tell you a little funny story that... Okay. Uh, when I mentioned sometimes uh, a dead rat. Yeah. We were training at one place. This is a, it's gone now, too. It was a, a little site just at the start of Old Town Alexandria in northern Virginia. Okay. And we had to stay locked up in this. It was like an old warehouse, and we would do things. But the, the bad part in there, there were rats. Oh, God. And so we trapped some of these rats, and we had our taxidermists trick them out yeah. so that they kind of like had a Velcro or they could have other types of seals in the body cavity. Yeah. And yeah, they'd also been treated with something so vermin, other vermin wouldn't come and take them or dogs. Right. They could smell that this was not a good thing to, to bite into. So yeah. we actually had dead rats that could be used. Wow. And you could use uh, the rats that we used for experimenting were, were Northern Virginia rats. But if you're going to do this, say, in Bulgaria or in uh, some other place, You'd have to use rats from there. Yeah. So that they looked like they were from yeah. that area. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So that was uh, one of the things. We trained uh, 
mostly in the Northern Virginia area. And sometimes for special training, we'd go down into the Carolinas or even Texas where we had, especially if we were doing explosives training, we had to get away from major areas. And those were fun days because you're just away from everybody and you could. How old were you when you were doing this? <laughs> About 30 something. Oh, really? Yeah. How long did you stay in the service? Uh, county military, 31, 32 years. Thank you but for 20, your service. Wow. Thank you. thank you. But 27 years with the agency. Wow. And uh, four that's years a, in the military. That's amazing. Yeah, it was pretty good. It was a lot of fun. Who could ask for anything better? Yeah. So um, we've talked about transitioning from one assignment to the other. Now, when I went to Africa, I had been on an assignment to Bangkok. My first assignment overseas with the agency was in an embassy, in, in a, our main embassy in Bangkok. And I was with the Office of Communications when I first came in with the agency. And we did all of the crypto and communications from the U.S. to everywhere. And um, it was pretty exciting. The Vietnam War was going on at that time. And we were the ones that sent and received all the flash. Flash messages meant it was the highest priority. You had to answer it immediately. And um, a flash message for permissions to launch. And a lot of old military people might know permission to launch meant you have to get permission for the bombers to take off from, say, um, Udorn or Uban, northern Thailand, to go bombing raids into Vietnam. So it was 24-hour operation, and you had scads of stuff coming in. Wow. Uh, so that was pretty grueling. We had uh, worked, you know, eight or nine hour shifts, 24 hours a day. So that was how I started off, and that's why I say I was happy being in Bangkok on my first tour of the agency, and it was pretty pretty good. And that's when they approached me and said, we have a special assignment for you in Africa. And I really was reluctant to take it, but they bent my arm a little bit and told me, in general, what it was going to be. It was a very, what they call the bigoted op. Bigoted means it's very tightly held, and you, not everyone can know what's going on. It was compartmented, but they call right. it a bigoted operation. So that was intriguing. That's why I took the assignment to Africa. So now I went to Africa, did my deal, <laughs> and went to training, and now I'm getting ready to go to um, what they call a regional base. We have regional bases around the world. Okay. And the regional base is tasked with doing operations in their areas. So I was going to be assigned my first <laughs> operational area was uh, out of Panama to north and or to central and uh, South America. And so that's uh, that the agency gets tasked with everything from counterterrorism, counterespionage. Counter narcotics was big at that time, so that's what I was going to well, go. Well, Panama about. was that that was the narcot narcotics time, wasn't it? Down there. Yes, area? it was, and yeah. also it was when we had General Noriega. Okay, there. there you go. Yeah. Yeah. So, can you tell us anything about that? Well, I a think it's bit? been I think it's been in the papers that uh, a lot of people said he worked for the CIA, but. He may have been an asset, but he was he didn't work for the CIA. But anyway, he was eventually arrested and put in jail. Yeah. Another controversial figure later on was um, Manuel Ortega, oh. who was uh, back. Some of the other pictures I have of me, they looked I looked like Ortega. <laughs> well, and, I'm sure Rick was, has a few more of yeah. you. Yeah. And I was taking a train, not that one. With yeah. the, uh, you look clean cut in that one. I was one. clean cut there for a yeah. Burundi driver's license. Okay. That's looking more like it. But uh, I was on a train for going from Frankfurt up to Berlin, and I was reading uh, a Spanish newspaper, and a guy in a seat across from me kept staring at me, and I realized on the back of the newspaper was a, a big photograph of, of uh, Ortega. And he thought, he thought it was you. Yeah. Yeah. And so <laughs> I didn't know that till, till later that yeah. I looked at the back. But anyway, the thing is, overseas, you have to blend different areas. Right. Uh, my friend and I were uh, caught 
looking like we were jackal guys. But anyway, we'll get into those later. So, um, well, you, this is you've fun. led a very interesting life now, haven't you, yeah, my it's friend? Scary. <laughs> yeah. To, to be uh, wow. Nowadays. So, so on your next show, what are we going to talk about? The next show, I believe, we're going to have Mr. Brown on. Okay. And uh, we'll talk about some stuff, and then the one after that, we'll go into some of the operations in okay. Peru, Bolivia, Colombia. Okay. Like that. Well, that sounds good. Well, we're glad you joined us today. And again, I'm sorry for the beginning. Uh, it's been a rough week for me. Please do me a favor and say some prayers for Dave Celine. Uh, I would really, really, really appreciate it. And thank you for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and share. And special thanks to my guest, Ken Walder. That's our show for today. Bye. Thank you.